Well, hello, and thank you for joining us as we discover our universe in this series of presentations coming to you live every two weeks with astrophysicists from the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology at Stanford University. My name's Dan Wilkins. I'm an astrophysicist at KIPAC, and I'm the coordinator of our public talk series. You can find out all about the events we've got coming up for you over on our website, kipac.stanford.edu forward slash discover. And on that website, you can sign up to our mailing list to get all the latest updates. And you can find the link over to our YouTube channel where you can watch any of our past talks again. Well, tonight, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alexandra Amon. Alex is a cosmologist who uses observations of galaxies to learn about two of the greatest mysteries of our universe, dark matter and dark energy. After being brought up in Trinidad and Tobago, she was awarded an island scholarship to complete her undergraduate education anywhere in the world. And this took her to the University of Edinburgh in the UK, where she stayed not just for her undergrad, but to complete her PhD as well. And for her PhD thesis, Alex was awarded the Royal Astronomical Society Thesis Prize for the best PhD thesis in the field. So we were very lucky that Alex came to join us at Stanford in 2018 as a Kavli Fellow, and she's now working as part of the Dark Energy Survey. She co-leads the team within DES, working to locate millions of galaxies in our universe and to look for minuscule distortions in their shapes that arise as their starlight is deflected by dark matter as it travels across the universe to us. So we're very lucky to have Alex here tonight to tell us all about the dark universe and how she and her collaborators are studying it using the Dark Energy Survey. Just before I hand over to Alex, I'll let you all know that we're going to have a question and answer session at the end. So if you have any questions from Alex's talk, feel free to send them in. If you're joining us on Zoom, head down to the bottom of the screen. There's a Q&A button. Just click that and you can send in your questions. And if you're joining us on YouTube, just put your questions in the chat window. But for now, I'll hand over to Alex. Thanks, Dan. Just sharing my screen. OK. Thank you everyone watching. I am super excited that you can take an hour out of your day for something that's a little bit different. Thinking about our universe is pretty special. Leaving aside the pretty pictures, the breathtaking landscapes, astrophysics forces us to think about grand ideas, to remove ourselves from the mundane day-to-day -day, stuck here on planet Earth, especially in a time of national elections and a pandemic, and think a little bit bigger, or in this case, think a lot bigger. The universe brings us wonder, and looking up at the night sky has marveled ancient civilizations all the way to us here tonight. So as Dan said, I do my research now as part of the Dark Energy Survey. Here's a view of the telescope that we use nestled on a mountaintop in the deserts of Chile. With the images that it captures, our team of experts tries to answer the big questions. So what is our universe made of? Or how did it evolve to the way that we observe it today? Now we humans are pretty terrible at imagining and understanding things that we have never experienced personally. With that, it is not hard to conceive that we might have flat earthers or people who cannot accept climate change as a worrying scientific fact. Astrophysicists, however, study the reaches of space and time far beyond human experience. Now, that definitely doesn't mean that we are without preconceived biases, but it is good practice to think outside of the box, which I hope that we all get to do tonight. So I'm gonna start by telling you about some of the important times that the universe made us think outside the box and scratch our heads a little bit, then, I'll tell you about the field and where it's at right now. And finally, about the dark energy survey. Now, of course, I have a pretty biased opinion, but astronomy or cosmology, the study of the universe as a whole, like no other field has this history of turning our views totally upside down and defying expectations and altering the way that we view our existence and our place in the universe. 
Starting way back, our first head scratching moments came in the 1500s from Nicholas Copernicus, who debunked humans very egocentric thinking that the earth was at the center of everything we knew and that the stars in the night sky revolved around our planet. This was a very controversial and brave claim at the time when astronomy and religion were closely tied. But thanks to him initially, we now know that the sun sits at the center of our solar system and that the earth is a third planet outward of eight, making a journey round and round. We know that even our sun is a pretty unremarkable star, not really different to any other in the night sky. Another revelation came from someone we probably have all heard of, Albert Einstein. He rewrote our understanding of gravity, the very law that governs everything we know. At the time, scientists were content that if I was holding an apple and I dropped it, it would hit the floor or that if I threw a ball across the room, we could predict the arc that it traversed when hurled through the air and exactly the position and the speed that it would land with. And that's motion governed by gravity. Isaac Newton's theory of gravity, the law of universal gravitation, had stood up to every observation on Earth at that time. But when astronomers started looking further away at larger scales and more extreme environments than here on Earth, there were cracks in the theory. So for example, Einstein, sorry, Newton's law couldn't quite explain the orbit of Mercury. So Einstein proposed an alternative theory for gravity called general relativity. Now, modifying the laws of gravity, that definitely needed evidence. His theory proposed that any object with a mass, whether a planet or an entire galaxy cluster, would distort the very fabric of the universe, which we call space-time. And that's depicted here by the grid. So as a result, the light from a faraway object gets bent as it travels across that distorted space-time. So light gets bent by the presence of massive objects. Einstein claimed that we should be able to see stars that were in fact behind the sun because their light would be bent due to the mass of the sun. And this would be the ultimate test of his theory. Now, of course, when the sun is up, we can't see any stars, but if there's an eclipse, you can. So in 1919, during a solar eclipse, teams set out to test this theory and found that Albert Einstein was right. His theory of gravity still stands today. But here were the New York Times headlines then. Men of science more or less agog over results of eclipse observations. Stars not the way they seemed, but nobody needs to worry. So while general relativity is the bread and butter of an astrophysics degree today, back in 1919, it was a bit of a blow to the way we understood the universe. Some years on, Edwin Hubble was the face of the next shakeup in cosmology. Equipped with the Hooker telescope with its 100 inch mirror on top of Mount Wilson, California, Hubble used the telescope's state-of-the-art light-gathering power to take a series of photographs of the Great Nebula in the Andromeda constellation. So for the first time, the images revealed faint stars in the nebula, shown in the image on the left. So this was the first time the telescopes had that kind of resolving power. Hubble calculated that the stars were at least 10 times farther away than the farthest stars in the Milky Way. Aha, the Andromeda Nebula was really the Andromeda Galaxy. Now this discovery implied that the other even fainter spirals were probably also galaxies even farther away. They were dubbed island universes. The belief that our Milky Way was all there was in the universe went right out the window. Just to boast the advancements in technology, here's the state-of-the-art view of Andromeda Galaxy or M31, our nearest neighbor to the Milky Way as we view it today. In the early 1970s, there was another blow. Vera Rubin, my personal favorite, set out to study the motions of stars in spiral galaxies. Now, the faster that stars are swirling around, the more gravity you need to keep them glued into that galaxy structure. So what did Vera hypothesize that she would see? The stars at the edge of the galaxy, she thought, would be rotating slower than the ones near the center, 
much like if you took Earth and moved it further away from the sun, then it would feel less of a gravitational force. And so it would move more slowly than it does now where we are. But instead, Rubin found something quite strange. The outer stars were traveling just as fast as the inner stars. What's more, she observed that they were traveling much more quickly than she would have expected. So if we count up all of the stars in a galaxy, we can deduce the mass of the galaxy and predict its resulting gravity. Now it seemed that the gravity that she predicted or that she calculated wouldn't be strong enough to prevent the stars with their very high velocities from flying apart, not being contained in the galaxy. This could only mean that there was some invisible mass and we call it dark matter. I love this photo because not only did Vera Rubin redefine our understanding of the universe forever, but she also redefined the idea of what a scientist looks like. We now know that dark matter comprises more than three quarters of the mass of almost all galaxies, including our own. It forms a much bigger stable halo, a dark matter halo, in which the light and the visible galaxy live. And thanks to its gravity, the dark matter acts like a glue that keeps the stars together. Another decade or two later, in 1995, humans' minds were boggled with the exquisite Hubble Deep Field. People must have thought that the director of the Hubble Space Telescope was mad. Space Telescope was launched into space and the director wanted to use his very special director's time on the best tool that we had to look at absolutely nothing. So he insisted that the Hubble Space Telescope would spend 100 hours over 10 days pointing at a tiny patch of sky about 1 30th the size of the moon, right near the Big Dipper's ha handle, that it was dark. We knew that we thought that there was nothing there. The space telescope's images changed the field again. After looking for long enough and collecting enough light, the telescope found more than 3,000 galaxies in that smidgen of sky. The image is absolutely teeming with spiral, elliptical, irregular galaxies, proving once again that it is simply impossible to comprehend the magnitude of the universe without some proper head scratching and maybe just quietly comprehending how majestic the universe is. So starting with these observations, we now think the universe contains about 100 billion galaxies and our Milky Way is just one of them. Finally, as recently as 1998, astronomers studied supernova. So these are the cataclysmic ends of a star's life and we use them to determine how far away their host galaxies are. You see, supernova always happen at the exact same point in a star's life when they're at a very specific luminosity. And so much like streetlights along a dark path, we can use that fact to calibrate how far away the host galaxy is. So we call them the standard rulers of our universe. So what the two teams found in 1998 still boggles us today. The universe was expanding but the expansion was getting faster and faster every day, an accelerated expansion. We attribute this phenomenon to dark energy, a mysterious component that makes up most of what there is in our universe, not to be confused with dark matter. We now know that everything that we're familiar with, the stars, the planets, the gases, they make up only 5% of everything that there is in the universe. About a quarter of the stuff is dark matter and more than two thirds of it is dark energy. So you see, time and time again, the universe has surprised us. None of these ideas were widely expected or even accepted easily. In fact, they often came with wild resistance, but slowly through the power of science and logic and reason, they were proven to be true. So I've hopefully convinced you that we must keep an open mind when thinking about the universe. And more importantly, that we have to let the data do the talking. We have to trust what science and peer reviewed research tells us. So with that, now I can tell you where our model for the universe stands today. So we cosmologists try to understand the story of the universe. And there are some pieces of this grand puzzle that we think we understand pretty well. We know that 13.8 billion years ago, the universe was this hot, dense soup of particles 
with very tiny fluctuations in the density of particles governed by quantum physics. We know that the universe underwent this period of rapid expansion called inflation, and that left an imprint of the density fluctuations at that time. Now this bit is important. We call this the first light of the universe or the cosmic microwave background. And what, like what's shown in the bottom left of the image, it's like a map of the fluctuations in temperature and in density of particles in the early universe. We now know that as the expansion of the universe marched on, those fluctuations cooled and expanded such that they seeded the large scale structure in the universe that we observe today. So the parts of the universe that were most dense in that soup formed the first clumps of particles, eventually the first stars and galaxies, and today the biggest galaxy clusters. So the random pattern in the cosmic microwave background is responsible for the pattern of the large scale structure that we observe in the cosmic web today. We know that right now the universe's expansion is getting faster and faster every day. And we attribute this observed phenomenon to a universe that is dominated by dark energy. We know that our universe is a cosmic web there are dark matter clusters and filaments forming the bones of the universe, which galaxies live in. Like in the simulation shown here, one made at KAIPAC by my colleagues, complex web structures of dark matter are shown in black. And you can see that they guide the location of the relatively rare clumps of normal matter or baryonic matter, such as stars and galaxies shown in orange. This is quite like Christmas lights wrapped around a dark matter scaffolding of the universe. Now dark matter does the job of gluing galaxies together and that's crucial to the formation of structure. Dark energy, the evil sister, undoes all that good work, pulling structures further and further apart, driving the accelerated expansion of our universe. Now, at first, dark matter and dark energy may seem like hocus pocus, or even that they are something that we here on Earth don't really need to care about. But without them, our universe would not have evolved to the way that we observe it. You see, our universe was concocted with the most precise recipe. So I don't know if any of you bake, but unlike how I bake, for the universe, there's no imprecise dash of this or handful of that, and there's definitely no recipe replacements. Without a certain amount of dark matter, there would not have been enough mass in the early stages of the universe to see the structure of galaxies, which became comfortable hosts for planets like our own. Without a specific percentage of dark energy, there would have been too much structure. Without dark matter and dark energy, and their cosmic battle, it's likely that we simply would not exist. So this is the foundation of our dark universe. It's well described by our standard model of cosmology. Now using a handful of parameters, we can describe the evolution of our universe exceptionally well. So we can make all kinds of measurements of our universe, whether it's exploding stars or bending light or mapping the velocities of galaxies across the skies, or using the first light from the universe that began its journey 13.8 billion years ago. And it's really quite remarkable that in our very insignificant snippet in the grand story of the universe, we can make all different types of observations that mostly fit a consistent model. That sounds pretty good, but there's an elephant in the room. What is dark matter? What is dark energy? We don't really know. There are fascinating and intricate experiments all around the world with particle physicists that are on the hunt for this dark matter particle. And though we have really good ideas or educated guesses for what they should be looking for, the fact remains that this particle has not been detected. And dark energy remains even more elusive. So cosmologists tackle this from a different angle. By studying the galaxies in our universe, we can tell you where the dark matter is. We can tell you what it behaves like. So we know that it behaves like normal matter with respect to gravity, 
but it doesn't interact with normal matter or with light. In fact, a dark matter particle would fly right through you. We can tell you how much dark energy there is. And so despite the elephant, our model holds up pretty well to whatever cosmological measurements we throw at it. So as our instruments, our techniques, our instruments get better and our techniques improve, they allow us to make more precise measurements. And so we keep on throwing at our model in the hope of either filling the cracks or reworking the structure of the model. But how do we learn about something that's invisible? One answer is weak gravitational lensing, and that's where I come in. So imagine a far away galaxy. As its light travels across the universe, it gets bent under, according to general relativity because the clumps of matter distort the very fabric of space time. And the path that the light is traveling along gets distorted with it, much like in the depiction here. Now that means that every image that we take of a galaxy is slightly distorted with the imprint of the cosmos between us and that galaxy. So a galaxy whose light travels past the same structures of the universe as another galaxy, they acquire coherent distortions and alignments. Like the two galaxies on the left here, their, their light passes on the same side of the same structures and so they get this coherent tilting. If we can measure these distortions with extreme precision, then we gain an understanding about that chunk of universe that the light passed through. So if the gravity of the structure in the universe, the gravity of the structure in the universe acts like a lens, much like our glasses, so we call it gravitational lensing. And what we're talking about here is a very, very small effect. Unlike strong lensing, this is a weak effect. The differences in the shapes of galaxies, we probably wouldn't even notice with our eyes. They're just such small differences. And so we need large samples of galaxies, millions of galaxies, to be able to make these types of measurements, a statistical measurements. So we can use weak lensing to tell us where the dark matter is. It's like our eyes can only see the light and only detect the light in the galaxies. But when we do a lensing analysis, it lets us put on special glasses that reveal where the invisible mass really is. Now, what if we had beautiful imaging data that covered huge chunks of our night sky? If we didn't just target a single galaxy or a single patch of galaxies, but mapped the large scale structure over a significant area. Take the diagram above. This is a box toy universe. The yellow galaxies at the back of the box travel through similar structures, the red dark matter web, and they appear on the images at the front to have a coherent alignment. Their images now tell us about the block of the universe in that box. But this isn't just about pretty pictures. We can use weak lensing to test the standard model of cosmology. It tells us how much dark matter there is, how clumpy that dark matter is, and so about the structure of the universe. But imagine if we could also slice our data depending on how far away the galaxies were. So slice this box into chunks. Then we could learn about how the structure has evolved over time. So we, we were using lights from faraway galaxies and the technique of weak gravitational lensing to pin down the parameters that describe dark matter and dark energy in our model. Now I'll tell you about one more story, the one that I'm working on, and I secretly hope that it ends like the ones that we talked about at the start of the talk, with unexpected results that force us to look a little bit closer and think a little bit harder. Let's go back to this picture. The gold standard experiment of cosmology comes from the cosmic microwave background. The Planck satellite was launched into space and it allowed us to pair back to the very beginning of time, a mere 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And it delivered a map of minuscule temperature fluctuations shown on the left and what we talked about before, the cosmic microwave background. Now compared to predictions of our standard model, the measurements made by Planck of the cosmic microwave background are an exquisite fit. 
My research focuses on the late time universe, one, the, the era now that is current and dominated by dark energy. When we compare our observations to the same model that is so well measured by the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, sorry, we have quite a beautiful end-to-end -end test set up. So the question is, can we use the same picture that fits the seeds of our universe to describe the vast structures that formed 13.8 billion years later? It's like having a, a baby picture in really high resolution. And until now, with the limitations in technology, only a very blurry adult picture. I'm trying to see if the adult is the same person or the same model, the same DNA. We also wanna understand what happened along the way in the person's life and predict what will happen in the rest of their life, or in our case, the evolution of the cosmos. Now, it's a, it's a particularly exciting time for cosmology. Let me set the scene for you. Technology has rapidly grown and with the most powerful telescopes in the world, there are several teams performing weak lensing measurements independently. We use much larger data sets than ever before, and we're desperate to see if what we find is consistent with our model, or perhaps if we find cracks in this grand picture. I'm gonna show you a plot, and this plot shows a compilation of the existing results over the years. That measure of a measure of the amount of clumpiness of structure in the universe. So on the y-axis, you're looking at the amount of structure in the universe, that parameter that we use to describe that in our model. And on the x-axis, you're looking at the year that the measurement was made. The gray bar here indicates the best fit model to the cosmic microwave background, state of the art, gold standard of the field. So it has stunning precision. It's a very narrow bar. The colored data points here are from all previous weak lensing experiments. The most recent in green from the European Kilo Degree Survey and its main competitor, the Dark Energy Survey in pink. Now there's something pretty curious happening here. None of these measurements disagree with each other to any real significance, but statistics knowledge tells us that your measurements should fluctuate around the, around the model. But what we're seeing is that all of the lensing measurements are low. There are very few measurements that are higher than the prediction. So these late time measurements, we call them, or measurements of the universe more in the current era, they predict a slightly discordant model compared to what the universe dictates or what this cosmic microwave background dictates. We have three options for what's happening here. It's either that the cosmic microwave background measurements are not quite right, but this is state of the art of the field and I definitely wouldn't be comfortable making that claim. Alternatively, the lensing measurements are missing something, but there's so many independent measurements on that chart that they'd have to all be missing something. The third option is that we need some new physics to fill in the cracks or some extension to Einstein's theory of gravity or an alteration to our model of the universe. Now, lensing is a relatively new field. And as I said, the signal is, is really tiny. So it's a very difficult measurement to make. And because it dares to threaten the gold standard cosmological model and from the cosmic microwave background, it's fair to say that our results are under scrutiny. Now I play a leading role in the dark energy survey. We are in the heat of our key analysis of one of the most powerful cosmological data sets until now. Very soon after years of work, we will add a new measurement to that plot that I just showed and we are being super careful. So here's a taster of what it's like going from late nights at the telescope to one of the most telling measurements of the late universe. After a handful of flights through Santiago over the mountainous Coquimbo region to La Serena, followed by a rickety car ride through the desert, climbing 2,200 meters of Cerro Tololo, brings you to the observatory. Up there, it is dry, it is high, and it is smack bang in the middle of nowhere. That makes it one of the best observing sites in the world. 
So mountaintops are very thin atmospheres with unobstructed views in all directions. The desert climate has less water particles in the atmosphere, and that's a good thing for astronomy because your water particles distort your images at the very last step of the light's journey across the universe to our telescope. And the remoteness of this location ensures minimal light pollution, a truly dark sky. The Victor Blanco telescope, the one that the Dark Energy Survey uses, stands the tallest on the summit and it is simply gigantic. That's me in the picture for scale. Its aperture and primary mirror are four meters and it sits on the fourth story of the dome. So telescopes run, run under the basic principle that if you put a bigger bucket in the rain, you'll collect more water. So the bigger the aperture or the primary mirror, the bigger the collecting surface for light particles that have traveled across space time only to be destroyed by the CCDs of our camera. Speaking of CCDs or charge coupled devices, the camera installed on the Blanco that we, the Dark Energy Survey use, is also huge. It is called the Dark Energy Camera and it has a DE cam and it has a 3.3 foot lens. It consists of 74 super sensitive charged CCD chips and a whopping total of 570 megapixels. The best iPhone on the market has 12. It allows us to image three square degrees at a time to exquisite resolution. Now that's an area of the sky that's about 14 times the size of the full moon. So at just one pointing, we can capture information from 14 times the size of the full moon. DCAM is pretty high maintenance. So 24 seven, it is cooled by a steady stream of liquid nitrogen, ensuring that the CCDs stay at a healthy minus 100 degrees Celsius. Observing life is pretty special. There's an afternoon meeting up at the telescope to make the observing plan for the night, a quick dinner down at the lodge, and then back up to the mountain top again. Once things are ready to go, the observers on the mountain emerge to watch the sun sink below the horizon. The sunset is spectacular, but humans aren't the only ones who've noticed. The Visachas of Cerro Tololo, something like kanga rabbits, they gather at dusk too, so you can see one there. So at sundown at the observatory, astronomers and Visachas alike are wide-eyed facing west. The noticeable quiet of the mountaintop is broken a few hours before sunset as the large dome of the Blanco creaks open. The telescopes look like guardians of the sky, perched on the summits. Giant robots that awake almost at once to peer into the cosmos. Throughout the night, they rotate slowly, doing their work. And we tiptoe around them with tiny little headlights that we get, taking what we can to learn about the universe. During the night, we take images of distant galaxies. So on a full night of observations, if there are no weather problems, we can take about 150 exposures. If we point at each part of the sky for approximately five exposures, that allows us to stack the exposures to get a deeper image. Then overall in the night, we can have 30 different pointings, each with five exposures. Each of these pointings is three square degrees, 14 times the size of the full moon, giving a total of 90 square degrees covered in one night. Now in each square arc minute, we can image about six good galaxies or galaxies that are resolved enough for our science. That means in one night that we image at least 1 million galaxies in our universe. In just one night, I still can't really get over that fact. So here's what a stacked and processed exposure looks like. Remember, 14 moons can fit in this area. So you can see the odd shaped field of view that the camera has with the CCDs laid out in this hexagonal shape. But when you zoom in to each of the, each of the CCDs images, all of the tiny faint fuzzy shaped blobs, those aren't stars, they're galaxies. Here are some particularly big, beautiful DES Dark Energy Survey galaxies. 
you can see that they really come in all shapes and sizes. So to do a week cleansing analysis and to learn about dark matter and dark energy, we need three pieces of information from our images. We need the locations of the galaxies on the sky. We need the shapes of the galaxies so we can estimate how distorted or how lensed they are. And we need information about how far away the galaxy is from planet Earth. Measuring shapes doesn't sound that hard, but the galaxies that we're dealing with aren't quite the picturesque spirals like the one in the top left. Rather, they're more like the fuzzy blobs in the top right. You see, the light particles from a galaxy travel all the way across the universe and they get gravitationally lensed by the large scale structure, encoding the secrets of the universe with them until they get to planet Earth. Earth's atmosphere smears and blurs the images. And then that happens some more thanks to the telescope. The detectors pixelate the image and then there's noise. So even that galaxy in the top right is probably a particularly good one for doing weak lensing. To measure the distances to galaxies, we use the fact that galaxies that are further away have different colors. So ideally, we'd obtain a spectrum for each galaxy, which is a special type of measurement that breaks the light into its constituents and gives you those black wiggly lines. But that's a very expensive measurement. It's easier to just to take images. So instead, we observe each galaxy with a different filter on the camera. And so when we have different filters, three or five different filters, that allows us to pick up different features and measure colors of galaxies. And from that, we can determine the distances to the galaxies. This all gets more complicated thanks to an effect that we call blending. So as our telescopes get more powerful, we're able to take deeper images of the universe. So we, we can resolve galaxies that are further away than previously possible. With that, and even just naturally, some fields are more crowded than others. And so some galaxy images are projected onto the others. Here's an example. There are the two big galaxies, but there are lots of small ones all around it. And how on earth does one measure the shape of that mess? Well, we do our best. And thanks to years of work by many people, we make a catalog of the positions and distances to and the shapes of galaxies that have surveyed, that we've been surveying. Now this field is rapidly advancing. Just a decade ago, weak lensing experiments used data sets that were spanning areas a few times the size of the full moon and boasting hundreds of thousands of galaxies. With the dark energy survey, it's a totally different fall game. Our data set maps one eighth of the entire night sky, and we will catalog, or we have cataloged, more than 100 million galaxies. With such a powerful data set, not only do our data analysis techniques have to be top notch, but our model needs to be robust too. Aside from the data, we need a theoretical model. So we use our standard model for cosmology and we need to be able to make predictions of what our measurements should look like. So computer simulations are crucial here. You see, any good school science experiment involves some kind of repetition. You may be growing tadpoles and wish to test which conditions are optimal. So you keep some in a container with pond weeds, some in a container without, and some you leave in the pond. There's repetition there and some factors are being manipulated, but we only have one universe. So computer, computer simulations bring astronomy back into the laboratory setting. We can tweak our model and see what the universe would look like if we added a pinch more dark matter or if we took away dark energy. And so they're really helpful in developing the model. Some parts of the modeling are trickier than others. For example, we measure how similar galaxy shapes are or how aligned they are in our images due to the effect of weak lensing. That all goes on the assumption that without weak lensing, galaxies are really randomly shaped and randomly oriented without weak lensing. But what if that's not true? We call those intrinsic alignments. It might be that galaxies that form in the same environments may already be similarly aligned and that would contaminate our signals. 
Or here are two galaxies merging on the left, and that creates a natural alignment between them. And on the right, a chance alignment of galaxies in, the row, in a row, an image we found in the Dark Energy Survey. Here's another sticking point in our model. It turns out galaxies are complicated. So they aren't just fuzzy blobs on our images that obey the rules of dark matter and dark energy. When we're looking at large scales, that's maybe true. But on smaller scales, there are all kinds of wonderful complex analyses that are happening within galaxies. So they might have black holes or as Dan told us about in another lecture, active galactic nuclei that spew particles to far reaching extents in the universe. These make our measurements pretty difficult to model at those small radii. But these challenges just add to the fun. The Dark Energy Survey is a large team of scientists from all around the world. And it exemplifies that science can no longer portray the image of a lone man scribbling over parchment on his own. These groundbreaking experiments require teamwork. And in order to change our understanding of our universe with the data, it requires that teamwork from a diverse set of people. We are hard at work fine tuning our methods and working through this enormous data set in the dark energy survey. And we're really at the stage of dotting our I's and crossing our T's. We anticipate that the precision of our measurements will shrink to roughly the size indicated here. But we have no idea where this data point will lie. Will it agree with the cosmic microwave background? Will it agree with all the other lensing surveys? Will it be totally wrong and off the charts? No, no matter what I prefer this result to be, it doesn't matter because we do our analysis with entirely obscured results. So we make our measurements and we tweak our model all essentially with fake data for years. And then when we are sure that we've done it right, we rerun the analysis with the real DES data, the real dark energy survey data. And in that way, we're set up that we can't bias ourselves towards the right answer, either consciously or unconsciously. So now we're just waiting with bated breath to see what we will find. Will our results support a consistent story for our universe with the standard model able to describe measurements of a universe 14 billion years apart? Or will we find more hints at a need for new physics? I think we need another more, another month or so to see. Now, even after the dark energy survey, there will be many pieces of the puzzle to solve still. So I encourage you to look up and keep thinking big and keep asking questions. Thanks. Well, thank you, Alex, for that amazing talk, um, really going into uh, some of the, the biggest mysteries of our universe and uh, some of the, the amazing work you and your collaborators are doing to, uh, to really understand um, how everything's put together. Um, so we've had a lot of questions uh, sent in, definitely a lot of interest from our audience, um, but I just want to remind everyone that you can still send your questions in. Um, if you're on YouTube, just put the questions into the chat window or if you're joining us on Zoom, head down to the bottom of the screen, hit the Q&A button, and you will be able to, to send your question in there. So let's have a look at these questions. Uh, so we've got a nice easy one for you first. Um, so you talked about this, really one of the most amazing discoveries in cosmology. Um, that our universe is expanding. And not only is it expanding, but it's accelerating. That expansion is getting faster. Um, but could that acceleration keep going on forever? Uh, yeah, exactly. We think that our best theory for dark energy is that it kind of um, replenishes itself. And so that accelerated expansion will just continue to grow and grow. Mm. And is there, is there a way we can, we can test that? Um, I think if we if we keep making measurements and seeing that our model works, then we're going along the right path, unless we find some kind of crack or more resounding um, sense of a crack in our model, then maybe we'll see that we're doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah, so I guess it's all about balancing up those those two forces in, in our model, isn't it? The, the dark yeah. energy that's trying to push everything apart and the gravity that's trying to pull it together. And um, we just keep testing the model as we understand it and uh, keep making more and more precise measurements. And, and if they all agree, we believe the model. And if they don't, um, 
then we keep keep going. And it's funny because people really can tend to confuse dark matter and dark energy because their names have the word dark, but they couldn't be more different. And so it's important to understand that that accelerated expansion we think is due to dark energy. Mm. Yeah. Um, so we heard about a strong gravitational lensing a couple of weeks ago, and tonight you you talked about uh, weak gravitational lensing. Um, could you just say that sort of a little bit for our audience about the, um, the what, what's the difference between between strong and weak lensing? How do how do we separate them? Okay, so to start this off, there's another fantastic talk in the lecture Keypack lecture series, Keypack lecture series on strong lensing uh, by one of my colleagues, Simon. And so the difference here, it's the same underlying principle that your light gets distorted due to the presence of massive objects and that happens, or that can be explained well in general relativity. But in strong lensing, you get these very visible arcs. Your, your image of a galaxy is totally distorted visibly. And sometimes you even get multiple objects uh, or multiple versions of the objects appearing in that arc or a full ring. So it's kind of the extent of the, of the lensing effect. Yeah, and in this case, we're just looking for those really tiny changes. Yeah, so you and I probably would look at a galaxy and not know whether it was lensed or not. But when you look at a statistical sample of them, you can see that overall, they all have this lensing effect. Mm. So, so is that how you, you really convince yourself that, that it is lensing? Because we, we saw the, the Hubble deep field image and just all those different galaxies, all those irregular galaxies way back on the, when on the, the far side of the universe. Um, so how do you know that it's not just an, they're just irregular galaxies you're looking at and that it is lensing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think that we have no theory that would tell us that without lensing, galaxies should all be pointing this direction. And we definitely don't see that. If you look at all of your galaxies, they're definitely not pointing all in the same direction. So we go with the underlying theory or the underlying assumption that galaxies are positioned as if I took a handful of them and threw them down, just totally random directions and orientations. And thanks to lensing, when we look at different patches of the sky, you can see that some patches are all distorted this way and some this way. So it's, it's really looking about the effect on, on lots of galaxies instead of just picking, picking out. Yeah. Them. And then you know it's not just something weird about all the galaxies. Yeah, you really can't do weak lensing without a very large statistical sample, which is why it's so neat that now we have these samples that are hundreds of millions of galaxies big. Yeah. Um, so you, you talked about the, the, the amazing dark energy survey and how you, you image one million galaxies per night yeah. to, to get these numbers that you need to do this experiment. Um, so how many of those galaxies that that you image are already known about and how many of these galaxies are new discoveries or is, is there even can you even tell when you've got that many galaxies yeah I, I don't think that they all have i don't think that all 100 million of our good galaxies and in, in our catalog we have about four mil, 400 million objects but 100 of them are are good they pass all of our quality checks and i don't think that we have specific names for all of them and so or that someone has really eyeballed all of them. And so it's quite nice when you're doing your observing run, one of the persons, there are three people and one person's job is to kind of check the images as they come through. And so you're just looking at these images of galaxies streaming in and you might be the only person who's ever looked at this galaxy before. <laughs> so it's really, um, it's too big of a number for us to sit and look at all of them one by one, but it is very special. <laughs> Yeah. And then I guess if you want to feel really small, you can think that each one of those is hundreds of billions of stars with maybe a whole solar system around it. And a, yeah. I mean, the numbers, the numbers game just becomes ridiculous because exactly as you said, if each of your galaxy has galaxies like our Milky Way has billions of stars and some of those stars have dozens of planets, I mean, <laughs> quickly escalates. Yes. Yeah. To, yeah. It's <laughs> almost impossible to, to think about those numbers. So on to sort of dark matter and dark energy themselves. Um, so we know that dark matter isn't uniformly distributed across our universe. You showed how it sort of clumps together in this halo around a galaxy. But what about the, the dark energy? Do we expect dark energy to be clumped together in bits of the universe or do we expect it to be more evenly spread out? Yeah, that's a good question. So. It they're, they're very different things to think about. So dark matter, we kind of think about as a particle still, whereas dark energy is this more um, mysterious 
substance that we think is everywhere, evenly distributed. So very different to dark matter in that way, no webbiness or clumpiness. Um, and that even distribution that even distribution of the dark energy uh, causes the accelerated expansion of the universe. And um, and because this, this uh, falls into the, the, the what as we call it the, the standard cosmological model, this idea that uh, that uh, yeah, our universe has these these basic ingredients, the um, the dark matter and the the dark energy that pushes the expansion. Are there any um, real alternatives to this standard model? Um, any alternatives to to dark energy that that really stand up to scrutiny, or is the the standard model um, sort of the best we've got? Yeah, so this, it, I think both of those statements are true. The standard model is the, the best that we've got. And it is true while we argue about these differences in the early universe and the late universe, it is true that, as I said, it's kind of astounding that so many different types of measurements kind of fit the same model. Um, so standard model cosmology is our best bet, but we do have alternative theories for each, each of dark matter and dark energy. Uh, so dark matter, we have a bunch of different types of particles that we think we're looking for. Um, with all kinds of names like the WIMP or fuzzy dark matter. Um, and dark energy, it could be possible that instead of dark energy, instead of some mysterious components that causes the accelerated expansion of the universe, it could be that we just got our law of gravity wrong on large enough scales. So there is a whole range of models that fall under modified gravity. And they work in the way where you remove the need for dark energy in some of them, and you just have to tweak your laws, much like how Einstein had to tweak Newton's laws of gravities when we started looking at larger scales. Um, similar to that, you tweak the laws and that explains the accelerated expansion. Um, but yeah, for each of dark matter and dark energy, there are a whole range of alternative theories and we kind of just play the game of like rolling them out one by one. And still the standard model is what is what stands up to all of our measurements so far. Yeah, and I, I think you said you said it yourself actually in the talk that um, that almost one of the most exciting bits about science is when we do an experiment and the universe completely confounds us. It doesn't just confirm what we believed was true, but it um, it throws another problem at us that uh, that we need a better theory or we need to refine the theory. Yeah, definitely. At least that's the stance that I take. And I think that people from our generation are kind of just waiting for their chance of the big thing that's going to rock the <laughs> rock our understanding of the uh, universe. Absolutely. Not not just reading the all these papers from clever people in the past and just finding out that they were right all along. But, uh, yeah, exactly. We need to get something <laughs> better. <laughs> yeah. um, so how about the, the dark matter itself? Um, so one, one question we had is, um, do singularities and black holes, um, so black holes, um, objects that have collapsed so much that the, the strong force of gravity they have stops light escaping from them, could they make up the dark matter or would we classify them under that 5% of the regular matter that went into the star that made the black hole? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's, uh, it's, it's definitely a good thing to think about. So as you said, black holes have this um, pretty hefty mass and we include them in our calculations when we're thinking about that missing mass. So indeed they are hefty, but they could in no way account for the missing mass that we attribute dark matter to. Um, so I think we tend to count them in that 5% of things we understand, but I'm sure you'd have words to say about whether we understand them or not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, I'd, I'd certainly spend um, a lot of my uh, my work time trying to understand them. So I, I hope we don't fully understand them yet. <laughs> I'm out of a job. I think we can agree that they're not the plausible explanation for dark matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's just nowhere near enough black holes in our universe. Um, so what are the, the leading ideas for, for what dark matter could be? Yeah, so that kind of change, it's, well, it seems to be changing slowly um, in the last years that I've been in the field. So our best guess is that it's this weakly interacting matter particle or a WIMP. Um, and the properties that we measure of dark matter with our cosmology experiments really inform the properties that we think the WIMP should have. So we know that it shouldn't interact with light, so it's invisible. Um, we think that it shouldn't interact with itself or with other particles like ourselves. So that's why we think that if there was a dark matter particle in the room, it would fly right through me. And we have evidence for these that make us deduce these properties. 
Um, so there's a famous observation of the bullet cluster where you can see two galaxies colliding and they kind of go right through each other. Um, and so that kind of tells us that dark matter doesn't interact with itself and it doesn't interact with other particles. Um, so there are these very fascinating particle experiments like big nets underground that try to detect um, a weakly interacting matter particle um, with no luck yet. Another popular contender is the Axion, which I am not um, <laughs> going to try to tell us about, but that's really gaining some traction in um, what a plausible alternative theory for dark matter could be, what kind of particle it would be. Yeah, so the, the idea that the dark matter is something that arises from um, from the um, the fundamentals of particle physics, the processes in particle physics that made the matter, um, the idea of the axion, I get, is that um, those similar sorts of processes can make this 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 dark matter particle. Um, yeah. And I guess that that answers another question um, here. So. Um, do we hope to detect dark matter within our solar system? And have we detected it in the solar system? Uh, not yet, but- uh, That's but we, a money uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> but we hope to soon. And there are still other, the, other than the Axion and the WIMP, that, um, I said quite assure myself, quite sure myself that dark matter didn't interact with itself, but there are models where they do a little bit interact with itself called self-interacting dark matter. Um, so I think there are really many cards on the table, but we still kind of accept the weekly interacting matter particles, our best bet. And we still keep, well, the particle physicists still keep looking for it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, certainly a lot to discover and um, very exciting uh, space there to look out for. Yeah. Um, so one thing you, you did say um, in your talk um, is that without dark energy, that the universe would have too much structure. Um, what do you mean by too much structure and what would it be like in a universe that has too much structure? Okay, yeah. So over time, when you have structures like a massive galaxy cluster, uh, because of gravity, they kind of collect, collapse on themselves and, and grow more and more dense. So that's how our, the same way that our the cosmic microwave background fluctuations seeded the structure of the universe, that process kind of continues to happen. And so dark energy kind of hits the brakes the other direction, preventing that from happening too quickly, too much collapsing of matter. Um, and so it's kind of this, you can run a bunch of different computer simulations showing uh, with less dark matter or less dark energy. And it's, it's this very careful balance of these two things that creates the exact amount of structure that we observe today. Yeah, so we don't just want everything piling on top of each other so we can't form a, a nice sort of solar system and galaxy. Yeah, because we live in a pretty cushy and uh, <laughs> stable environment in our galaxy, and and that uh, requires careful amounts of each type of, of um, substance in our universe to exist. Yeah. Um, so for the last couple of minutes, uh, just turning slightly away from the science, um, so how did you end up as a cosmologist? How did you end up researching dark energy and dark matter and, and where we came from? Uh, yeah, sure. I think this is the answer that you're not supposed to say, but I really wanted to be an astronaut. Um, as I grew up in the Caribbean and I definitely didn't know what an astrophysicist was when I was growing up, um, but I kind of hoped that I would be an astronaut and I thought that the right path to do that would be to study astrophysics. Um, you should really study engineering if that's what you want to do. <laughs> but it turned out that this is um, really nice. You don't have to like risk your life. You can just <laughs> study the universe for the entirety of your life. And uh, so it kind of, it, I guess it's stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, it's a pretty special job to kind to get to think about these kinds of grand questions. And that's just your day to day. So. Yeah, for sure. We're definitely very lucky. And, um, yeah. and, and I'm sure I don't just speak for myself when I say once you start thinking about these things, it, it's really difficult to give it up. <laughs> um, once you fall in love with doing this research. Yeah, that's for sure. So um, we've just got time for one more question. And um, so what breakthrough in astrophysics are you looking forward to most over the next 10 years? That's a good one. Um, so I think it just depends on what you define as a breakthrough. So for the dark energy survey, I secretly hope that it that it that our measurements do stay persistently low um, and that we don't get this happy picture of everything fitting the cosmic microwave background. And that might not be a breakthrough. It might not be that there, that, that means that we need new physics. But to me, it's exciting to figure out what each of the experiments might have done wrong uh, along the way. Those would be breakthroughs, in my opinion, for the field. Um, I think the one that we can bank on the most is 
we've got to get something on dark matter in our lifetimes, uh, whether it's a detection of the particle or conclusively ruling out the weakly interacting matter particle. Um, I think each of those, I think that's the, the hope that we can that we can bet on for the next 40 years or so. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And I'm definitely looking forward to that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Alex. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And um, if you would like to see Alex's lecture again or any of our lectures again, um, they're all over on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Kaipak. We'll be back in two weeks time, Tuesday, August 25th, when Dr. Ke Fang from Stanford will be talking about cosmic rays and some of the highest energy particles that we can find in our universe. And you can find out all about that over on our website, kaipak.stanford.edu forward slash discover. But for now, stay safe out there. We'll see you again in two weeks.